Um, um, anytime he goes to somewhere, and I remember I was, I was like, wow, what a cool guy. If I can be like Larry Koo and sure. be on call for a week straight and still have a smile on my face, um, then, you know, this is the program I want to go to. Um, and uh, it, was, it was awesome to kind of watch him grow his career. He went on to UCLA um, and uh, headed up the uh, spine program there. Um, and trained a lot of people I know um, and did residency. And he, over the last 10, 15 years, is now doing a lot of um, outpatient surgery um, and really pushed the envelope in minimally invasive spine surgery. And as a neurosurgeon, you know, um, has done a lot in the field and um, is very accomplished and well-known. And then the second thing we have to acknowledge today is Dr. Jens Chapman's birthday. So, Larry, it's it's really awesome to have you here. Um, and uh, uh, we're really looking forward to your talk. And I've been such a fan of yours for so long. Um, and uh, we really, um, you know, and we love working with you at SSF. Um, and, you know, you're such a great teacher. Um, and uh, this is long overdue. So welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Rod. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And it is. I, when you tell those stories, it's just marks time. I'm like, that was 30 years ago. That was almost not quite, I think it's 23 years ago, 22 years ago, yeah. something like that. And I was like, oh my God, we've gotten old. The kids are born, go off to college, all kinds of things happen, yeah. but yet here we are. <laughs> I don't think any of us would have predicted where we would be in 2020. <laughs> so, but thank but thank you so much for having me. I, today, you know, really what I wanted to share was like, since you've known me and since I was doing my fellowship, I had the honor of kind of getting involved on the ground level of minimally invasive surgery. And, you know, now it's become such a commonplace thing. I think everyone who does spine surgery, we do some form of minimally invasive surgery, but really um, like for the bread and butter aspects of our, our daily work, what we see in clinic, what we see on a daily basis, it's sometimes nice to go back to talk to the fundamentals. And uh, one of the particular things I wanted to talk about was one of the earliest takes on minimally invasive surgery was less invasive tubular or endoscopic assisted um, treatment of spinal stenosis, because that was sort of one of the very, very first takes, the MED tubes and that concept of tubular decompression, uh, muscle sparing type approaches, first kind of came about in uh, the early 2000s, and the late 1990s, uh, credit to people like Kevin's, Kevin Foley, Mo Smith, uh, who really pioneered it. But the reason I bring it up is was there was always a question that, you know, is this really necessary? Is less invasive techniques necessary for this particular type of spine surgery because it's a good operation. It worked well. And here's a paper, the sport trial that we all know and love in the mid 2000s that basically said, you know, lumbar spinal stenosis is such an important pathology to be treated by less invasive techniques. And because of that, because of less invasive techniques, um, uh, you know, there, there's no question that patients who have failed conservative therapy for spinal stenosis and in general do better overall surgical decompression in terms of short and mid and long-term outcomes. And so that paper, this paper has been replicated, the follow-up data sets have been done, and the data sets have been replicated in multiple other prospective trials over the years. So the question is always such that, do we really need to do something better for an operation that we know is effective that does work. You cone down on classic laminectomy, which has been done for over 60, 70 years, um, beginning in the 30s, it's very clear that there is room for improvement. And even in a sport trial, which was done in some of the best academic centers in the country, we can clearly see that there is a clear complication. These are laminectomies. These are not spinal fusions. And yet you can see on the sport trial, uh, there was a clear transfusion rate. There's a clear wound infection rate, length of stays or three to four days at that time in the mid 2000s. And infections continue to be an issue because these are older patients. These are patients who have difficulties uh, with any type of surgical procedure. So this tissue morbidity, secondary complication, it was clearly a role that minimally invasive surgery techniques, surgical techniques could play to improve this overall concept and the overall outcomes. And again, 
we this is an old slide, but it reminds us all what minimally invasive surgery is about. It's not small incisions, but it's about minimizing tissue approach trauma in a perfect world, optimizing the amount of decompression we do to decrease postoperative instability by unnecessary resection and damage to soft tissue and ligamentous structures, and also therefore decreasing tissue injury, which is something that we don't talk about enough, but tissue injury causes a stress inflammatory response in the body. It also mobilizes and utilizes resources of the body to heal from. So all these things lead to longer length of stays, longer recovery times overall at home, and also secondary complication rates from infection and necrotic tissue. So that's really what minimally invasive surgery is about. It's not small little incisions. And so really what we were talking about early on when we started publishing some of the early literature on uh, uh, surgical minimally invasive tubular techniques is using the simple tube portal to basically access the spine and do the decompression that we normally do over one, two, and three levels and versus a wide open laminectomy that creates a great deal of dead space and resects biomechanically pretty important structures like the midline. And I think that's the most important thing to realize is that the spinous process and the lamina are critical structures for the attachment of basically essentially every single muscle in your back from the multifidus to the longissimus to all the muscles that essentially act at the level of the spinous process. So the spinous process resection is a biomechanically wretched procedure, and then not to mention it creates a massive dead space from the muscles that thereby have to retract from the empty cavity that we create during our laminectomy. And unnecessarily so, because it's not the spinous process that's ever the pathological structure in, minimum, in a lumbar stenotic patient. So going forward, what we realize is that, oops, that we began to say, well, can we through less invasive tubes with and without an endoscope begin to access the spine, get into the spinal canal where the pathology actually lies and decompress the spine and neural foramina and achieve the same outcomes without taking the midline, without biomechanically destabilizing that segment of and lung muscles and also at the same time, getting less dead space and tissue trauma, thereby potentially creating better outcomes. This is our original publication from 2000, uh, from work we did from 2000 to 2002, when I was a young fellow and, and, and subsequent graduate at USC, as Rod was saying, looking at just that. And what we found was that we could, in our initial series of these endoscopic uh, type discectomies, by simply angling the wand around, we could, through a unilateral approach, achieve reasonably good looking, minimally based decompressions, preserving posterior soft tissue attachments, and most importantly, not cheating or not cheating the patient uh, as well, let's see. So the technique was simply this. And since that time, the other thing we've combined is image guidance, like say, optimizing our trajectory. So this is a very typical workflow. This is what we do. We register the patient and don't need to belabor the how we do image guides. I think everyone watching knows how we do this. But we put some type of tracking registration. We have O arms. We have interoperative 360C arms like the ZEM units. And simply put, we register the patient with the percutaneous spin, do the, do the spin, and then go forward. Then we use the minimally invasive uh, image guidance systems to basically plan our approach. We make our paramedian incision, and this allows us the, the luxury of also knowing the angles we need to achieve. Every patient's lamina is a little different in terms of the angle of the spinal laminar junction. And this allows us to be able to offset our incision enough to, to get where we need to go. Then once we're done, we, we plan, we're planning our trajectory so we can make sure that from that skin incision, we can get to the other side. We can get underneath the spinal laminar junction. And these are the nice things. And then we go ahead and mark our incision, as you can see there. And we can go ahead and make our incision and begin the standard kind of classic tubular dilation. One of the critical things that we've learned over the years, and I've got to give credit where credit's due, Kevin Foley years ago said, hey, why don't we pre-inject that same pathway with marcaine and ephrin, and before we even scrub, so that will vasoconstrict muscular blood vessels, periosteal blood vessels, the stupid little recurrent artery pars, and then go ahead and dilate. And you can see the tubular dilation. This decreases pain response initially in the cytokine response, and also decreases soft tissue trauma response. 
but then we just go ahead and do the standard tubular dilation techniques and wanding is very important again another concept put forth by Hal Matthews Rick Fessler and Kevin Foley and ourselves or in the early to say you just strip the muscle a little bit off the underlying bony structures, less tissue or section work needs to be done that way. Again, the goal is muscle splitting, muscle peeling, not cutting. And then once you have that, we have we establish our tubular corridors. So with that, you can see there, the tubular axis is completed and we are able to get our, our tubular things. So again, we take, oops, we once we've established the tubular Quarter and we know we're pointing the right way, we will see typically this view, the spinal laminar junction. And see, that is our goal. You see in the stealth windows, our goal is to get across the ipsilateral laminotomy. We draw our ipsilateral laminotomy initially to achieve access to the base of the spinous process. So a little bit different than normal. We don't go straight down to the dura, but we go down to the ligament flavor. And now you can see we're drilling essentially across. We're looking through the tube, this is a technique that's well described. And here we're adding the additional dimension of image guidance. With the image guidance, this is a procedure that a lot of people, including myself at the beginning, get very lost. And it takes 50, 100 to not be lost all the time. Our young fellows, when they start with us, this is the operation that confuses them a lot because you have to turn the table so you don't have to operate at a hard, hard angle. And then you have to know where your drill is physically going. You have to know that you're where you are. So our goal is to essentially drill underneath the spinous process through a small initial laminotomy uh, and then drill over the top of the ligamentum flavum and keep the ligamentum flavum there the entire time to preserve the underlying dirt. It's a safety measure. You keep the flavum, the flavum is your friend. And that allows you to drill across the inner table, if you will, of the contralateral lamina, arriving eventually at the facet. And here's some diagrams and, and charts on the bottom to see exactly what we're going for and ultimately the, the, the quarter of decompression that we're ultimately trying to achieve. And so there you see us protecting the dura. Now we, again, starting to drop the tube you drop the tube to achieve an angle, and that rotation of the tube is graphically demonstrated with the image guidance tracking, which you can use the tube. And now we're really going underneath the spinous process to go across. Now, once you finish the other side and you're confident you've gotten to the contralateral frame, and then you can rewind the tube back. And now you can see we're doing a much more conventional top-down ipsilateral laminotomy, ipsilateral uh, facetectomy, and coming around and you can see us working the facet down in the video diagram and still keeping the ligament and flavum down the whole time. It's your friend and making sure you do all your bony work beforehand that keeps the bleeding to a minimum, not to mention protects the dura. But once you're comfortable, again, you see us now taking the ligament and flavum, taking it down and it, just doing the standard laminotomy, ipsilateral laminotomy that you normally do. And again, the image guidance component uh, at clarity, you know you've gone high enough, you've gone low enough, you're lateral enough, and you can find the nerve root takeoff and the axilla of the nerve root to make sure that you're not missing, for example, an SAP remnant or superior articulating process remnant that's still impinging into the axilla and the framen of the nerve. Because that, unfortunately, you can see us exposing just the takeoff of the neural framina right there. And of course, one of the things that is often brought up and that we encountered over many years is through a tube, it's actually sometimes hard to reach around the ipsilateral corner of it. And you can see us beginning to address that issue here. So a lot of times you free the tube to angle it more towards yourself to achieve around the corner of the facet. Again, you don't wanna take the pars, you don't wanna take too much of the facet, but you have to do the job. You have to do the job of the ipsilateral framal compression. John McCullough would often talk about the five levels of stenosis. The, the, ex, the shoulder of the nerve root, the nerve root frame in itself coming out, the axilla of the nerve root, the discal level, and then the lateral recesses that passes down inferiorly. And those are the five areas traditionally where spinal stenosis can occur. So it's important to address all those areas based on the preoperative CT scan and MRIs to understand where the pathology is. Image guidance adds that clarity and adds that directionality for help in understanding. And then you can simply move the wand around and use your image guidance to check to make sure you're pointing in that area so you can know you can get to the pathology. And so here you can see, uh, here you can see 
the ypsilateral decompression and again we're wanting back to ourselves and just let's see if i can yeah but as i mentioned it can often be difficult the limitation of the tube hitting the spinous process can often be difficult this leads us to the concept that it's actually easier to get to the contralateral far foramen because we're going underneath the lamina we wind up in the medial facet we drill that down and you often see the contralateral nerve root going out very clearly and often the disc space and the axilla and the, and the lateral recess are laid out for you. So you basically have this wide circumferential side to side view. Your side, the ipsilateral side, turns out to be the more difficult side. And this is where, because we have preserved the spinous process, we have preserved the midline structures, the tools make it difficult to visualize. So we've had to, over the years, use a variety of curved tools uh, to decompress the ipsilateral side to solve the problem of our ipsilateral side. So preoperative selection, preoperative planning is very important. We will often come from the contralateral side to decompress the most symptomatic radicular side. And this is an important concept. You can get the central canal from both sides fairly readily, but if there is a side that the patient is having more radicular symptoms, either by his symptoms or his EMG, then will often come from the contralateral side. And of course, if there's a bigger pathology like a synovosis, more facet hypertrophy, more foraminal stenosis, we'll often pick the contralateral side to come from just so as we go across, we can do a very full down the line decompression of the contralateral foramen. But we've also, like I said, developed special tools, angled curettes, angled kerosene rangers, things like that to do. This is an example of a tool that we've been working with. It's a curved shaver. It connects to a, it's like an arthroscopic curved high power shaver that we connect to our standard Midas or on-spot motors. And we are able to actually reach around the corner with a shielded guard to essentially perform the ipsilateral facetectomy and foraminotomy, reaching out along the nerve root safely to decompress the nerve root, but again, preserve the functional facet, ipsilateral facet joint, and to preserve the, uh, the uh, pars interarticularis. And here you can see some post-op CT scans and reconstruction of what we mean by this. We can get the frame and well decompressed. Angled kerosens have traditionally been used, but again, we take the spinous process. With this tool, we can achieve these excellent far foraminal, middle foraminal decompressions and, de and basically run the decompression along the top of the nerve root, as you see in that uh, cartoon window up here, with, and, and not damage the underlying nerve root, and also, again, preserving the biomechanical structures we've been talking about. So, and then we put a probe to make sure that we're all the way out, so to speak. And there's the tool again. You see us shaving on the bottom screen, and you see us working that facet angle down. Let's see, Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. Oop. There we go. So, oop. I think I hit the button too many times. So, outcomes. What can we achieve? That's the basic flow. Once we've done the decompression, oftentimes. We'll, again, lay down some steroids, epidural steroids, some duramorph paste. We've experimented with that over the year. And then we'll deeply infiltrate the tissue with, uh, with uh, long-acting bupivacaine, close the dead space as best as we can. And this then typically close with internal sutures and leave dermabond. So this lends itself greatly for one, two, and three-level decompressions for outpatient procedures. I will be the first to say that it's very, very important to think about hemostasis. During your portal removal, it's very important to take a look at the soft tissue as you're, as you're coming out. And we've been using long-acting bupivacaine and things like that because as you're removing the soft tissue, as you can see in the video if it plays here, you can see the muscle collapses back in. And this is the entire concept of minimally invasive surgery if you kind of put it in a nutshell. Muscle sparing, losing the dead space, and making sure you infiltrate the muscle with some type of pain analgesic. I also recommend, especially in multi-level decompressions, putting seal and things like that to get the little venous bleeders. Because one of the problems you may have heard about through minimally basic multi-portal T-lifts and decompressions is that there can often be a seroma or a hematoma there. So we are meticulous now about looking around with the tube as we're pulling out, getting little venous bleeders, putting seal and surgifoam in the epidural space, making sure that we've 
then our best possible job of decreasing venous ooze and seroma collection because postoperatively that continues to be a problem. So these are little tricks I, I hope I can pass to you over the years to do, decrease your incidence of delayed kind of almost like a compartment syndrome, like a pressure feeling that patients will sometimes report and delayed seroma formation. Later on when patients will come to the clinic, will call into the clinic and say, there's a little bump on my back and it hurts when I kind of push on it. I get almost like neurological symptoms. So these are things you can do to decrease. That. And a lot of times in multi-levels, we'll actually put a pressure dressing, like a little curlex ball over the dermabond, tape it down and ask them to keep it there for about two, three days. Again, to just kill off the dead space, even when they go home. And these are all little tricks that we have, and we have them wear the, um, uh, the back brace, uh, like, a, like not a full brace, but like just a, a binder, just to get maintain pressure on the muscular dead space and chemo and bruise that essentially we've created in that area. So these are little tricks that we've done to optimize our outcomes and decrease our soft tissue kind of issues. So we went on to publish the, our long-term outcomes of this in 2005. We've subsequently had another publication in 2010, but we looked at this. So great, soft tissue improvements, shorter length of stays, this is wonderful. So we had 498, almost 500 patients uh, between our three centers at UCLA and uh, subsequently here at USC again. And what we've learned, and we had 48 month follow up, uh, we had about 92% 48 month follow up, and you can see one, two, and three level operation rates. And we did the standard follow up. And if you look at the complications of the difference, I mean, people say, what is the difference between minimally invasive surgery and open surgery? And one of the perioperative charts here demonstrates soft tissue secondary morbidity, urinary tract infections from stasis, from people hurting, laying in bed. DVTs from pain of multi-level laminectomies and infection rates. You can see the infection rates are tremendously different here. So these are percent, these are percentages, and you can see that there's a significant difference in wound infections, soft tissue morbidity transfusion. And again, I brought up the original slide from the sport trial to show that these complications are not normal. People say, well, laminectomy is such a benign operation. It's not a benign operation. If you look at any institutional database, you'll see that just standard DRG laminectomies are associated with significant transfusion and wound infection rates. It's not zero, it's not 10%, but it's some number that costs the institutions and our patients significant costs and morbidity. So that's what minimally invasive really is. And in our early series and in subsequently a long-term follow-up, what we also learned is that if things are uncomplicated and you don't have a SF leak, minimally latest, the 61% or two-thirds of our patients can leave the same day, uh, leave the same day or within 24 hours, whereas only 7% of open lacnectomies because of various issues, drains, pain, whatever, could leave within 24-hour period. And that's a huge, a huge step forward, as Rod was saying, about pushing the minimally invasive surgical envelope. Because as costs uh, in our society become more and more difficult to contain a movement of smaller procedures and even single level fusions to the outpatient setting becomes more important. And this is the type of data we needed to show that we can do this effectively, not achieve the patients and also achieve good fundamental outcomes. And then most importantly, and this is the most important thing, we cannot cheat the outcomes of our patients. The pa we're here to decompress the, the spine. We're here to restore their walking distance. We're restored to radiculopathy. So you can see there was no difference in terms of outcomes, long-term one, two, and three-year out and four-year outcomes in gait limitation, distance walking, 100 time yard walking tests, radicular pain, and back pain scores as well. And so that was our two year. And if you look at the ODIs out to four years, it's interesting because there is a trend, statistically significant only at two years, but not at four years, to less ODI, to a better ODI score. And that correlates with their back pain scores actually to some degree. And we have to believe that that has to do with the muscular ligamentous biomechanical, more stability, if you will, all the muscles are still attached to the patient. And the reason we think that explains the ODI scores. I'm sorry, there's, here's the leg scores and the back scores. No statistical difference at all in the leg scores because we've done a good job decreasing the frame and hopefully with both surgeries. But back scores, again, you see the divergence of that. That slide's mislabeled. That should say a, a minimum invasive de decompression. But really, this is the key. Because we preserve all the bio biomechanical structures, the spinous process particularly. Again, God gave us the spinous process for a reason. That's why 
go to the Natural History Museum. Dinosaurs have spinous processes, right? Because the biomechanically, they're an important structure. So whenever you take the spinous process of one level, you understand you detach the multifidus for the two levels below and also some of the short segment rotators and the longissimus of the levels above. So this is why lamin post-laminectomy spondylolisthesis is a very real entity and is seen in almost every single long-term laminectomy series done today. That's why new imaging slip at two and four years, recurrent residual stenosis from excessive movement and the need for repeat compression and the need to go on to need a fusion at that level are significantly statistically higher in the control arm of the study in the open laminectomy one, two, and three level groups. And you can see the differences highlighted there. So this is where we believe that the, the theory and the promise of minimally invasive surgery is validated. Less uh, perioperative morbidity, soft tissue complications, shorter length of stay, cost savings up front, and finally, most importantly, equivalent spinal stenotic outcomes and a suggestion of a decreased back pain short and long term, and most importantly, biomechanically, saving operations for fusion and progressive spondylolisthesis. So long-term cost benefits society as well. And you know, these are important for both the one year and the long term, what's called quality of life year or cost calculations, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. But these, the, this is where, uh, again, as we go forward, oops, hopefully it'll fade. Um, uh, See, we back up a few slides here. Sorry, Linda, can we go back to that cost slide? Uh, this is it, yeah, this is the slide. So we went ahead uh, with the School of Public Health at UCLA and uh, here uh, in Keck. We went ahead and did a quality of life year adjustment calculation. If you look at, again, what, for those of you who, who don't follow this, you know, most of us would rather not stare at this kind of stuff. But now I think, unfortunately, everybody involved in healthcare has to be at least conversant with the concept of quality of life years. In other words, that's a cool operation, your 10 level scoli operation from T4 to pelvis. That's a great operation, but the quality of life year is outrageous. And what it means is, how much money do we have to spend? to bring that patient through, treat that patient's pathology to give him a good quality of life here and restore him to some reasonable level of function. For example, index operations in orthopedics, for example, for a total hip or to total knee, they calculate at about $21,700 cost for total hip, everything, physical therapy, all that, to get that patient back to a reasonable quality of life the following year. So if you look at open laminectomy, this calculation has been done several times and we did it again for our study. And we calculated about $13,129 for the quality of life year and things. And if you, have, if you happen to notice, that's very close to the DRG, the Medicare DRG of the laminectomy. Our the typical laminectomy DRGs uh, are, are payments to the hospital are somewhere between 11 to 15,000, depending on the region you're in for a single level operation. And with minimally invasive surgery, we've shown from decreased reoperation, it's hematomas, wound infections, shorter length of stay, we could drop that number down to $10,900. And as we've moved into ASC settings for this surgery, that cost savings comes even more down because obviously the cost of ASCs is significantly lower than inpatient hospitals, even if you have the same length of stay because of the, cost, the more expensive nature of hospitals in general. So that's basically it. The basically minimally invasive surgery now over the years has fulfilled the promise of treating the most common spinal pathology in our older population, which is spinal stenosis without instability or deformity. And so this technique of tubular decompression, although initially, quite honestly, it was a pain in the ass uh, and it required a, a fairly significant long learning curve. I think the hump, the road over the mountain, if you will, was justified and all of a sudden we feel vindicated or validated that the, that the, the lessons we learned were, were worth it in the sense that A, it let us do a classic operation, not cheat the patient outcomes, achieve good patient outcomes, as good as classical open laminectomy, decreases the, decrease the complication with both short, middle and long term and bring the patients, not only to the patients benefits uh, pain relief, 
uh, improvements, improved outcomes, less back pain, less delayed operations, and by that way, to our hospital system and to the healthcare system, decrease cost by decreasing the quality of life for your calculations and taking on already very good operation from a public health point of view and making it even a better one for our patients. So therefore, allowing us in the modern day to not get restricted for this particular operation and get uh, and continue to perform this as our population gets older and the demand for this particular procedure increases. And also, uh, most importantly, not cheat the patient's outcome and restore them to functional outcomes, which I think so many of our patients now really want despite their 70, 80 year old age and allows us to you know, weirdly operate on even an older segment of the population. So that's, that's I think really what I wanted to share, our kind of 20 year journey of this particular operation and to uh, let you know that you know, there are real benefits. It's not marketing hype, it's not publicity, it's not a hopeful wish, but we now have all the data to support that. Uh, and then reference to Rod and uh, my original professors and mentors in cranial neurosurgery over the years, one of the things that people said, oh, you know, there's no data and outcome for, out for spinal, sur spinal surgical outcomes for fusion and things like that, like cranial stuff. And I always smile because the truth is there's tons of data. We have tons of data. There's been tons of data published through various study groups. And we have more data to support, to support lumbar spinal stenosis decompression than almost any operation we do in neurosurgery. So that having been said, thank you so much for having me, Rod, and uh, and, and Ash, and, uh, and 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 Jens, if you're if you're on, and uh, I really do appreciate everyone's time. So, Larry, that was a great talk, um, and one of the things I have to say is that you know that just looking at your um, your uh, PowerPoint and your demos, you know, I think you've been doing this long enough that for you, it's it's not a big deal. <clears throat> to go contralateral. In fact, um, you know, we have, we were fortunate enough to have um, Dr. Jeff Rowe kind of join our group. Yeah. He's more of a minimally invasive surgeon. I think there's a real art to how you do these. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, you need specialized equipment. And I know a lot of people, what's your thought on um, uh, endoscopic spine surgery? And the rule for endoscopic spine surgery in um, in laminectomies, number one. Number two is, um, you know, now that everything is moving outpatient, when do you decide on a patient? Is it the number of levels? Is it the comorbidities? Can you go over kind of what you do in terms of who gets outpatient versus inpatient? Um, the rule for endoscopic surgery. And then the third thing is, is I think one thing that you just talked about, which is overlooked, the outcomes for laminectomy for stenosis are so great, it's unbelievable. Yep. But here we have insurance companies, payers, now for example, United Healthcare and all these, like in our state, um, they're coming up with a million ways to, for you not to treat someone um, right. who has severe stenosis. They go, oh, you have to do, PT, you have to order an MRI, you have to get injections, you, you know, here you spend $7,000 and then th we know the outcomes are better if they have a laminectomy, right. um, you know, based on their symptoms. So if you could address those three, that'd be great, Larry. Absolutely. You know, Rod, it's initially when we started these Titans, and uh, I'll, I'll take the first, I'll take the outcomes question first, and then I'll back up and talk about the technical aspects, uh, technical considerations as we move to ASC, because that's in part a two-part answer of the benefit of ASCs and the discussions you can continue to have with payers. Okay, so lumbar laminectomy, like we said, data, outcomes, they're old. They've been around for years, and th there's clearly a benefit-benefit to the, uh, to the concept of decompressing a stenotic patient. And all those tests you said, Rod, the physical therapy, the epidural component, the, uh, the MRIs, all the stuff you have to do beforehand, all go into the quality of life your measurement. The qualities I was showing were the surgical quality of life your cost. But if you include the, the treatment cost of an overall pathology, the number uh, for treating uh, lumbar stenosis is massive. 
and of course insurance companies they don't think to limit they're stuck in this mindset that you know we're going to limit surgery which is the most inspect in fact uh, expensive aspect of treating spinal stenosis but that's a heavily flawed consideration if you look at pub modern public health data where they're able to break down from the day a patient gets diagnosed by anybody doesn't matter who their primary care doctor or whatever with lumbar spinal stenosis to the day to get the treatment ironically rod and you can uh, I'll, I'll get the sources i think at some point to everybody but the overall number of dollars spent surgery actually winds up being less than 40 percent of the total cost 30 40 percent and it's because they have typically had multiple epidurals they've typically had multiple physical therapy chiropractic treatments three four months three months of physical therapy can sometimes be ten fifteen thousand dollars of total payments you add epidural injections one or two and the event costs of that and they'll typically have spent the insurance companies will have paid something like fifteen to thirty thousand dollars before the patients even come to surgery if that makes sense from mri imaging costs emgs whatever but the point is is that when you actually sit and dialogue with them as we've done through the section spine section SMIS, isas and actually talk to people then the payers go oh well we didn't know that the outcomes are so clear that it's actually better if they fail clinical conservative care for three six months that it's actually better for them to have spinal surgery and then not only that it's actually cheaper for them to have spinal surgery because as we draw the quality of life your costs down to an eleven thousand dollar drg then the payers would be like oh my gosh absolutely this makes sense and that's unfortunately something that we as societies at our society level have to do a better job of but on a local level i think rod yourself you know uh, uh dr patel yes everybody can talk to your local payers in a you know local regional level to have this conversation to your local blue cross bears and that's something we have certainly done to all our little hmos or ppos and our groups here and our crosses around here and signals around here so we've showed them the data we've helped them understood the process that this is a process that eight out of ten times is going to go to surgery at some point in time because they're not going to get better from epidurals and then they're more prone to let us get goes earlier to surgery, especially now with the ASC data that uh, ourselves and a lot of other people are generating in terms of cost savings. So I think that's the educational process that goes over. And I know it's tiring and I know it's frustrating, but that's why the, pur the purpose of today's talk is to show that, you know, just by modifications of workflow, tissue sparing, quicker surgical times and things like that, we can get these cost savings in ASC, which brings us into your second question. The ASC environment requires optimization of workflow. If you think about it, if you start to go into an ASC, the trick with most spine surgeons that makes it difficult for us is you just gotta be very efficient. You can't have everything in the room. And the patient comes in the room and they have to be pre-selected, they have to have the right comorbidities, they have to be, and again, these are older patients, the average age of a lumbar stenosis decompression patient is around 67, 68 years old. So it's older than the fusion population, typically significantly most serious. And of course, you would expect them to have comorbidities, cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, so on and so forth. So pre-selection is critical. And it's very critical. And then because of that, the anesthetic regimen is very critical because in older people, you have to rely on lighter anesthesia. We typically even, we barely do any, we use a very light, almost TIVA short-term type of anesthetic to decrease intracranial events, decrease blood pressure fall. And we pre-anesthetize with the injections like we talked about. We have this whole, you know, uh, you know, rapid uh, anesthesia protocols that we talked about. But because of that, these uh, selection criteria and selection sheets now exist very readily. Um, and we can, we'd be happy to get them to you. Mike Wang has them, guys like Kern Singh, everybody has these things. And we select our patients based on a stratification much more detailed than the typical ASA selection criteria, anesthesia ASA to right, pick the older patients that can still undergo these relatively small procedures. And that's the thing I want to emphasize. Doing correctly, they become a relatively small procedure. So I personally believe, and you saw our earlier slides, that it's about workflow. The endoscopes, you saw the initial uh, series of minimally invasive decompressions we did were actually with a tube with an endoscope in it. So we did gravitate for a while to using foraminal scopes and things like that. But the difficulty is for the vast majority of patients that we treat, there's a lot of bony stenosis. I mean, big honking facets, right? Big bone spurs, 
hardened calcified synovial cysts. So we need drills. Simply put, we need things that shave and drill. And that's where traditionally the uh, lumbar endoscopes and things like that don't do as well. The new generation endoscopes from like Joymax, from Stortz, from, uh, from Wolf, and from Eloquence, they now have more powerful drills that you put in. And in fact, traditionally, one of the problems with endoscopic, true endoscopic surgeries was you would just put a tube in and then put the drill in blindly and drill fluoroscopically, which obviously is a little dangerous. But now everyone has developed good routers and high power drills to really effectively do bony work through endoscopic surgery. And this is pure tubular, like Tony Young type endoscopic work, like like uh, 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 Chris, uh, Chris Hofstetter in, in your neck of the woods, pure endoscopic decompressions with those third generation endoscopic platforms with the drills can achieve impressive results. Very impressive ones, as good as the ones I'm showing uh, with our tubular techniques. But uh, again, the learning curve is tremendous. And from a workflow point of view, I think every surgeon as he moves into an outpatient setting has to think about the learning curve for an endoscope. So for myself, I climbed the tube, the climb, the tubular decompression thing, and now we work through 14 millimeter tubes. And I, at least, I hate to say it, I'm beginning to become a bit of an old dog and harder hard to learn new tricks. So for myself, for bony hard stenosis, I now pretty much rely on a 16 millimeter, 14 millimeter tube, and I just wand it around, and I, that way I can get my thin drills, my curved bayoneted drills in there. Which brings me to my third point. Even for this classic tubular technique, you're right, Rod, highly disorienting. I remember doing my fellowship, I would walk out of that room and I would literally just pull off my lead in frustration, throw it on the ground and goes, well, why don't we just do an open freaking laminectomy? That was so painful. I was lost like 80% of the time. And it's the disorientation, Rod, that you talked about. So when we train people, and like we've done it our courses together, and when we train people in our actual ORs, I always have a regimented process that I always take people through because it's like throwing or it's like swinging a golf club. You have to teach people almost how to relearn to do their spices because when you're working through a tube, your hands make very small motions. You have to use bayoneted instruments, bayoneted drills, get your hands out of the way. Endoscopic, pure endoscopy, you don't have to deal with that as much, but you still have to deal with the trajectory of your tube. And you bring up the critical point. It's getting lost. It's known that you've actually contralaterally gotten all the way over. And this is why without image guidance, we traditionally have always draped the fluoroscopy in such that it's sitting in an AP position. In other words, I'm working on one side and then if we ever don't know how far across we are, we usually know how far north and how far south we are because we use the attachment of the ligamentum flavum. We look for the ends of the ligamentum flavum. Once it starts thinning out above or below, we know we've gone high enough or low enough. But it's contralateral that we get very confused on. So we bring the floral in it. We keep it draped in AP position. We just wand it in and out of the way. Whenever we're lost, we just wand it back in. And I shoot a floral with the drill bit off, touching the dura, uh, touching ligament and goes, see, that's where we are. And you have an AP floral to see how far across you've actually gone. And also it's helpful, again, to let you know if you're going too rostral or too caudal. In other words, are you going to go through the pars or are you actually going through the SAP tip, which is really what you want to take? And it's that, or sometimes you will get really lost and you wind up going towards the, the superior pedicle. And so these are all the things you can do, but intraoperative AP floral, just swinging in and swinging out, doing checks, that's critical. Then, of course, with image guidance attached to our drill, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Lou Tumi Allen to develop the image guided uh, Midas drills, for example. And we learned that if you just put a tracker on the drill, you don't have to use image guidance the whole time, but it's so helpful to essentially keep you on point, keep you in the right trajectory, and then make the operation very efficient without you getting lost or doing any unnecessary drilling. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but those are the kind of things that you have to do to get better, not be disoriented. And then now, like, you know, you're right, I've done a couple thousand of these things. And now I can re reproducibly do, like yesterday, we did a three level lam lumbar lamini. Each level took about 20, 25 minutes. So we did three levels in about an hour and a half with the approach and the closure about an hour, 45 minutes, two hours. One level is reproducibly for us about 30 to 45 minute operations. Two levels about an hour, hour 15. So this is the thing. 
by making little steps. Every surgeon like ourselves, like Rod, everyone knows, we get better with experience, but really you get better by optimizing the little workflow steps. And then like ironically, we always say you go slow to go fast, right? So you make sure each step is done, you don't get disoriented, and you do all these little tricks, the pre-injection, the wanding, knowing where your tube's pointing, fluoro checks, image guidance, expiral, all these things will make the operation better. And then and make you faster as well too. So I know that's a very long-winded answer. Again, I'm sorry for that, but you know, 20 years is a long time to get good in the operation. And did you do that three level as an outpatient or was it an inpatient? Outpatient. outpatient. She went home uh, six hours later. Yes. How much of your practice that, now is, is uh, outpatient versus inpatient? I'd say two thirds. Wow. For all our one and two level procedures for laminectomies, certainly all outpatient, all foraminotomies are outpatient. One and Two level cervical fusions are outpatient. Uh, now, one two level artificial discs are obviously outpatient. Wow. Um, one level, one level exless will do an exless front and back single position uh, as an outpatient. They go home. Uh, when I say exless out, out outpatient, I mean twenty three hour stay, eighteen mm -hmm. hour stays, and uh, and uh, you know it always takes our colleagues to push us a little bit. And I have friends like Kern Singh who've pushed me to now start discharging patients after four to six hours because. You know, we, we're confident and we have very good. Another thing that I didn't mention, as you go to outpatient, you have to have mechanisms in place for outpatient follow-up. In other words, you call them that night, you call them the next day and things like that. But that's, it's, it's shifted to almost two thirds now for us. But the, obviously the bigger things like multi-levels, the scolies, the, they're, they're, you know, front backs, they're still all staying, of course. That's great, Larry. I'm gonna open it up. I'm kind of hogging the, the questions. I think Dr. Chapman um, just jumped in. Um, and I know Jeff Rose here as well. I'm going to open up to the to the faculty. See see if they have any comments or questions. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much. Uh, a wonderful presentation. I love the use of the uh, stealth uh, guidance. This is one of the big things about getting lost in the contralateral space that I think is underappreciated, and uh, knowing where you are three dimensionally is so critical in this kind of a procedure. Um, <clears throat> Uh, two questions. So, um, uh, one, first of all, um, obese patients, uh, they may all be up here in the Northwest and not in LA. Um, is there an advantage in the BMI expansive patients of, let's say, 40 plus, I'm not even talking about 35, to doing these kind of surgeries? And have you seen some limitations by having to navigate through a larger soft tissue envelope? Absolutely, Jens. You know, Ironically, the bigger the patient is, the more soft tissue you have to get through, the more advantage there is in minimally invasive surgery. However, because typically in you know, open any kind of surgery on an obese patient, you basically make a giant cone. <laughs> you do this massive exposure to get down to this tiny little area on the bottom. The, min the minimally invasive tubular approaches allow us to go straight to the pathology. But that, of course, obviously make the use of image guidance and stealth navigation is so critical because you can basically point the tube and go straight to it. The truth is in a larger patient, again, because of the cone and the stereoscopy of your eyes and the ability to move instruments, you have to use a bigger tube. You have to use a slightly larger tube. And that's where uh, you saw we do most of our decompressions through tube tubes. But in fatter patients, sometimes we'll use expandable tubes just to expand the top part a little bit. So it creates, again, that cone. So it gives us ability to move the instruments. And also in a long, like, 10 centimeter, 12 centimeter tube, your, your eyes can't have no stereopsis, even through a microscope. And so that's, that's something you have to think about. But to your point, hematomas, seromas, uh, fat necrosis, all these things are significantly reduced in a uh, obese patient. And that's honestly where we think we get the most benefit, less wound infections, less seromas, less tissue breakdown. And, uh, and, and most importantly, just less time spent on the approach because you go straight to the pathology without the typical retractor, 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 and then you get there an hour later and do a 20 minute decompression. So I think that that is one of the greatest things. But to your point, the deeper the patient, the bigger the patient, everything from soft tissue to your instruments to the length of the tube, you have to take that into account and have long bipolars, long angled curettes, long drills. And I would say that image guidance for us has made the biggest biggest difference in those people because when you're working at a long depth and length it's easy to get lost it's just so easy to wind up in the wrong level or the wrong space of that level and 
honestly, that's happened a fair amount of time. So image guidance is a great, <laughs> is a great security blanket to do, to have over your shoulders as you go into those tougher patients. Um, Axel has a question, but uh, let me ask my second critical question. So while <clears throat> the reintervention rate uh, for dural tear seems to be lower for MIS surgery because of the um, dead space issue, um, the, uh, my understanding of the literature is that there are more dural tears. My uh, empirical um, evidence is much higher. So I do a lot of revision surgeries. And again, I'm now pretty well prepared to kind of have a dural repair after an MIS decompression, because at least in our, as you call it, neck of the woods, um, the chop zone um, uh, um, spine area, uh, the, the shaving off of the dura, especially centrally for the contralateral decompression, seems to leave the dura wanting. Again, not an immediate issue, uh, but when they come back for a revision, I found a nasty surprise in that area. So incidence of dural tears higher or not um, in uh, minimally invasive decompressions? I think, Jens, you bring up the critical issue. When we first published our initial lumbar stenosis paper uh, in 2002, our dural incidence of tears was 10 to 12%, probably honestly higher, like 15%. That's really high. That's three times to four times higher than the reported sport trial series, reported, you know, any series. And why? Because we're disoriented and we're having a tough time working through tubes, long reaches, contralateral long angles. And so a lot of times you're sweeping and you know, you and I both know that you're reaching over with that angle carat, uh, angle kerosene, you're taking that one bite and it's always that bite in the far corner that you can't quite see and you push and then you see the leak. But to your point, because the lamina is still intact, we got away with it a lot intraoperatively. We'll just put like a piece of, of, of Duracell or Tisseal and we get away with it. And that's a problem. And so that's why, in truth, image guidance has been very helpful in that sense, because it keeps us, I know this sounds silly, but it keeps us in the bone. And what I've learned is we don't touch any of the ligaments and flavum at all uh, to uh, initially do the impression. We keep that on it, almost like our buddy, our friend. And then we go to the ends, as I mentioned earlier, of the ligament, the flavor attachment at the superior lamina and the inferior lamina. And that's where we get really, really careful. So the, one of the big tricks I, we've learned over the years to decrease the incidence of dur incidental durotomy is to get to the edges of it and then put cottonoids in very steadily. Because essentially what we're doing is we're detaching the lamina from of the, the ligamentum flavum from the bone, almost creating like a ligamentum flavum window, if you will, and then peeling it back. Because it's when we try to bite the flavum off the bone, we have tremendous incidence of even incidental durotomies and to your point, Jens, delayed pseudomeningocils. I mean, we've all seen them in our patients and other patients as well. So one of the other things I do, so if I'm at all concerned, and this is an important thing, is I will, even if I don't see an obvious leak or I see a tiny little rent, I will go ahead, lay down a piece of, uh, of duragen, and I've gone more now to the sewable duragen or the, the thicker one, and laying down tissue. So that way, at least, that if any poor uh, soul has to come back behind me, there at least is a layer, a layer to help that person out and to decrease, to your point, Jens, a, I think, underreported, understated, because we don't image these people a lot of times, understated incidents of stable pseudomeningocele that many, many of them have. And that's why I also mentioned that the incidence of delayed seroma causing almost a compartment syndrome and spinal stenosis recurrently is also underreported. And so I think a, 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 a meticulous attention to hemostasis, filling the dead space with something, I don't care what it is, duragen, tissue, anything, to maintain tamponade. And these duras are often very thin to begin with. So I think what you said is very, very critical. So our threshold for laying down a piece of duragen and tissue prophylactically to create a layer, even in the case of where there's not an obvious leak, is very, very low. And in fact, I would say at least two thirds of our cases, I wind up leaving something behind uh, just for that reason. So, and so surgical experience, disorientation, uh, uh, trying to bite ligaments and flippings far and away from you, and also not prophylactically uh, reinforcing the dura are all things that are very, very important. That's why we spend a lot of time now on those uh, perioperative and postoperative management things. And that's why we actually put a pressure dress on that binder, again, to decrease 
and maintain you know the, the pressure there abdominal pressure so it decreases the incidence of that delayed thinning puncture opening whatever you want to call that Great, thank you for the answer. And the abdominal binder, that's a great new trick. Um, uh, I'm gonna use that probably. The, uh, the trick that you showed in the video with the tissue is a great one, by the way. This is an old UW publication. It's a wonderful hemostatic yeah. agent. Uh, much yeah, overlooked. I love it. Uh, one of the questions from our education director, Dr. Patel, Akshal Patel. So um, basically with these uh, uh, tubular type procedures uh, that are kind of microtubular almost now, uh, truly small tubular procedures. There's a whole new generation of instruments uh, that we have. Basically, you don't use any conventional instruments anymore, like off-axis drill bits now, yes. and, um, and uh, angled and around the corner articulated um, resection tools. So um, how much of what you're using now is actually remotely conventional anymore, and how much is actually totally de novo? Yeah, it's funny. And you you, you hit the nail on the head because really the last 20 years have been about instrument modification, really, you know, from the tubes to the bayoneted curettes and that, that tool I showed you, which is an angled shaver, which looks much more akin to like an orthopedic surgeon doing an acromial decompression type of shaver, right? And so you're right. And so basically, <laughs> in some ways, the last 20 years have been us kind of wandering around the arthroscopy world and looking for tools that will be helpful for us particularly just and like the the image guided drill I was showing you that's actually called a clear view piece from what from Metronics and uh, these companies and the beauty of all these new drills is you, you can actually click it and change the it, it's kind of curved bayonet but you can actually click it to change it so it actually kind of points you know in, in a, you can check turn it like a clock so it can point up point down curve up curve down and and then endoscopy is the same it's about tool development and I'd say 70% of the instruments I use for my standard day-to-day are uniquely developed for the tubular things. So that's why the learning curve, unfortunately, unfortunately, in, in that particular perspective, uh, Jens has actually steepened uh, because when a traditional spine surgeon starts looking at the typical array of tools laid out in front of him for a typical tubular decompression set, it's a little uh, uh, a novel. It's not, there. some of them are not familiar instruments because most surgeons I know are used to drilling with straight drills, but um, the, the, the bayoneted drill in itself is a, is a weird thing and it takes some time to get used to. And the bayoneted turning image guided drill, well, that's something most of us have never trained with. So I think that's why I think you have to give yourself the time to do it and not expect that this is something you just be able to adapt because it is not your daddy's Cadillac like the old, like your mama you know anymore and it's it's a little different than a lot different in truth because uh, it's the little things that disorient surgeons the most as you know it's like I my son got me a new set of golf clubs and I'm playing like crap with them even though they're like five, five <laughs> times more expensive than my old piece of crap clubs but they're just so they're just disorienting enough that I'm not hitting well with them so I think you have to be honest with yourself and give your time for that adaptation and also to your point Jens not trying to do it all at once. And I think that's a big mistake. A lot of our younger trainees come out or like people who've been in practice for a while and want to adopt minimum invasive. You can't, you got to walk before you run. And I humbly put to you that I've spent hundreds of hours in cadaver labs, just practicing and learning tools and courses and, and then just taking my simple patients that I don't even need to do a tubular decompression. Like, yeah, I started doing a lot of these techniques in just lumbar discectomies. Like I'd be doing a lumbar discectomy. I was like, hey, I'm just going to shave this a little bit, get practicing with this new curvy drill I have. And that's how you implement new technologies, not just in sports and golf, but also how you implement new technologies in any procedure. Because you can't just jump off a cliff and go, it's going to turn out okay. And I think that's a big, big mistake. Larry, thank you. I'm going to ask Ra to take us out. We're getting a signal that we're out of time. So thank you, Larry, from my end. Great to have thank you. you man. Thank Great you, Rod. Thank you. Hope, hope everyone stays safe and is doing okay through this mad times. For both yeah, thanks so much, Larry. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we really enjoyed your talk. And I look forward to seeing you in person. Me um, too. And uh, um, again, uh, I really... Um, congratulate you on your work and um, what you've accomplished and thanks for pushing MIS to where it is today because I know a lot of us have been benefited from it so thanks again Larry thank you so much guys you're kind for okay. having me Appreciate take care guys have a great day thank and you guys. happy birthday to Jens <laughs>
No one, you're 45, no right, Yen? No one got disconnected. I'm going down from here. I put up the, I just watched Larry and Yen's. They totally were able to ignore mine. Uh oh. <laughs> oh. That's awesome. So <laughs> that's awesome. And there is, is there going to be football this year? I don't know. We're not sure yet. Yeah. Soccer tomorrow, Bayern Munich, Champions League. Nice. I, that, I've been living on watching the Bundesliga. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow, uh, no, Saturday, Champions League, Chelsea versus uh, Bayern. So I'm going to wear my red. I'm a Chelsea fan. I suspect you're a Bayern fan, Jens. You got a steep order. Hey, it's great to see you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.